So I've done a quite a bit of work with the, uh, with the chisel and uh, a couple of hand planes to get wood removed from the side and I'm in the stage where I would like to produce a more or less straight planar surface along the rib edge and then I will begin presenting it to the mold and deciding how much material to remove in which areas and begins a rather long process of carefully fitting the rib using hand planes. But um, to get between the chisel and standing up hand planing it, uh, as I showed you, um, there's another stage that I like to use, and that is I have a, uh, a large wooden jointer plane mounted on my vise. Um, it's, a, it's called an apron, um, and it's, a, it's just a, a top of the plane, the top of the workbench is like that, and there's a piece of wood mounted there, and you simply block the plane against that facing upwards so that you can do this. This plane is very sharp and it's set very uh, generously so there's quite a bit of room for the chips to fall through. There's a lot of shavings like that under there. and. Um, it's not really a fine fitting process, it's more of a process of getting this straight and flat. But because of the length of the plane, it works very, very well and reliably. And I never ever have the impression that I could be uh, um, splitting it or doing something that's going to harm the rib. And then it's, even though you're passing your fingers over the blade, I don't think I've ever cut myself doing this. So. Um, I'll probably do it while I'm making a video. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, so, like that, and you can really control the removal of the material very, very well. And it works very quickly, and you very, very soon approach the correct profile for the rib because it automatically miters the joint and also produces more or less planar surface, which is what you've attempted to make on the mold. So you're, you're kind of matching some kind of geometrical um, ideal. And of course, there's fine fitting to do after that, getting the, the surfaces really, truly meet and made it together. But to get approximately there, this is one of the quickest and simplest ways that I've ever found. Well, so far, I've spent um, maybe 15 minutes producing this rib plank, and uh, I will probably spend uh, an hour to 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes to an hour uh, getting um, the, the rib finally fitted. Uh, I have to say that I'm sure there are luthiers who have done, who are able to do this much more rapidly than I can. I've never really found a quick way to do this. It's not exactly a quick process. And uh, I would say the difficulty of making flat, flattened back lutes is, is higher than Lutes that Renaissance lutes that have a, cir a semicircular cross section, where in which the uh, the, mid the midline of the rib um, is uh, more or less equidistant on to the edge of the joint on either side. I hope that explanation is clear enough. Um, so that these ribs are deviate so much from the ideal rib that you would make that on a Renaissance lute that really they have to be fitted extremely, it's rather a slow and, and painstaking process. It just takes a little more patience and you've got to have had some experience in fitting ribs um, on, a, on a smaller loop first before you try one of these larger ones that has uh, more ribs like a multi-rib loop. take a complete shaving off the whole length of the rib, I know I have achieved a more or less linear surface. This takes a bit of flipping it back and forth with the this again. You can hear it's coming on the whole length. That's what we're trying to get to. And now I'm about maybe a few millimeters um, just left of wood that I'm going to remove probably by hand clean. At this point, you can see that uh, I got the main part of the joint along here more or less done. There's still a couple of millimeters there, or one, maybe one millimeter, along this side of the joint here. 
And if I hold the rib just slightly over there, you can see that the, the template does accurately describe the overlap. So this, this material should be removed but very slowly and carefully. At this end, I've pretty much gotten um, a, a good joint. Uh, I, can, I can move the camera and show, you that, show that to you. So it, what I'll do then is um, I will just simply take the, the plane and remove this material here and then holding the rib against the mold make sure that this edge of the rib blank is tight down to the line that I want. And I'll make sure that that is the case all the way around. And by removing very small amounts of material in succession, I will make sure that my rib, by, by, by holding it flat like this and sort of hinging it like that, I can see where I will need to remove material and um, always making sure that the outer edge of the rib is held flat down to the mold. So um, it's not a question of just holding it up to the, the, the joint line here and taking material away. I have to be sure that there are two requirements. One is that the outside is held down flat, otherwise the rib won't, it, it sort of turns under like this and, and it, it, as it meets this joint line. And it's very important always to keep those two requirements in mind and not just simply whether it fits. Otherwise, eventually the, the, the loop ribs will flare away from the mold and I'll end up with um, a kind of bubble here and, or, or down here where I don't want it. And that will be um, a problem for the appearance of the loot. Uh, down at this end of the mold, you can see there's only a very small amount of overlap there to, uh, you can see there's, a, there's just a, a small amount that remains to be removed along here, but that the, the main part of the rib, but from about back here down to about here, is, is accurately, accurately cut. So I just have to remove a bit of material there, and I'll do that with the jointer plane on, mounted in the vise, once it turned upwards, um, to get, make sure that I'm always staying straight and making sure that the outer edge of the rib joint is flat against the, the this outer the the, the joint of the, the next one. It's very important that that always be uh, absolutely accurate and and smooth. So sometimes I will actually end up cutting into the paper on the uh, here on the on the um, on the rib line, on the template in order to. So that the rib is essentially being nibbled away and moving towards the joint in order to keep it always straight. If, if we just remove material in one space or in one place or another, that's not ad actually adequate. We have to remove the whole slice of material in order to keep the joint planar. Um, it's a it's a bit of a funny three-dimensional problem, and uh, it does take you getting used to when you when you first build loops. To, to get that idea across exactly how material should be removed. If it's just done cautiously, that's not enough. You have to have a sort of imagination as to how the rib is moving within a theoretical space. You can see I've now removed that material and uh, the material that was, that was there and I, I've now got the joint in the correct profile and the correct um, alignment between about here and here. So the, these two ribs more or less align correctly right here. This is often a problem where the loop rib bends the most. Uh, there, there's a mismatch and that just means that the, the loop rib hasn't turned under enough. And you have to keep removing material here and here at, at the front of the, mold, of the, of the blank to, so that it's constantly turning in this axis this way so that we are always looking to this edge of the joint so that it it's always going to be flat to that part of the mold. It's, it's, not, it's not enough that it fits here. It has to be fitted there as well. And that just takes a sort of sense of feel. You just hold light finger pressure and you just feel the joint and, and feel the way the, the loop rib wants to move. If you feel there's a bump and the loop rib is moving this way, that material should be removed. Here you can see what I mean. I've removed more material here and a little more material here in order to get this joint to be uh, better, more congruent 
with the previous rib. So you can see if I press the, the loot rib down against the mold and move it, it hinges at this point. This means remove material here, even though I'm cutting into the template, in order to make that completely flat so that it will meet here and it will meet here. And even a very small amount removed here, just a few shavings, will cause that uh, disparity in meeting at these other two end points here to close up. It's amazing how little material needs to be removed. It's, it's extraordinary. I never, I always seem to take more, I take two or three strokes of the plane. It always seems to be too much. I should just discipline myself and remove only one, but I can't. I, I have to get the plane moving a little bit first and then and see and judge how much is being taken off. It's, it's a delicate balance. Okay, I got the loot rib um, about 90-95% 90, fitted. It, it, it fits well all along its length and uh, there's only a little bit, bit of a bulge here, but I, I'm beginning to feel I'm cutting into the template a little bit along here and I'm beginning to get the feeling that the template is actually not accurate and that's always true because uh, if you peel it off you can easily see why that would be because you can easily move the tape this way or that way and I can still, if I actually move the tape just a bit and say, okay, now that's going to be my new mark because we're mostly fitted and the, the template wasn't really that accurate to begin with. So then I've really only got to decide um, how much material to remove on this side to get this to match up with that. And you can see that the template is a pretty accurate line here. It's within a couple of millimeters. Um, so at this point, it's probably better to remove the tape so, uh, because I can easily really see better what's going on with the joint um, along this line here if I can actually, if I, if I don't have it obscured by paper. So I, 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 this is just the way I am. I, I can't stand not to see exactly what's happening. So at this point, I will simply take a piece of chalk and draw, because chalk shows up very well in rosewood. I've tried pencil and it doesn't work. You can just draw a little bit of a line along the outside there and give yourself a kind of very, really a pretty wide mark to describe about where you think. You can also do this. You can put it actually on the um, mole and just look and see where it is approximately and draw where you think it's going to be underneath. And you just lift it up and see where it is and then you kind of draw where you, where you thought it was. And, and you, can, you can pretty quickly decide more or less where it is. Later on when I've got this side of the joint completely uh, fitted, I will remove the uh, paper of course and um, I will use a compass and I will uh, describe, I will measure the exact length at all these different little points here and I'll make, I'll just make marks on the rib, the, the one that's fitted already and uh, I will remove the paper and And then I will take a compass and measure each one of these distances all along here. First of all, I would make marks, corresponding marks on the rib, making sure that it's fitting in about the right place. That's the main thing really, is getting it to fit just where you think it's going to fit. This dimension doesn't really matter so much with this kind of wood because it's rosewood and the grain is mostly running this way. There's really nothing delineating it across the grain. But if you were using maple, figured maple, for example, you would have to be very attentive to a line drawn previously on the rib lengths that would match them exactly um, so that they were matched precisely at a point. But with rosewood, it, it's not really apparent because there's nothing to, to obviously mark the grain um, in, its, in this dimension. So, um, what we want to do then is just get where the rib seems to lie, really its most advantageous position, make our marks uh, across the, at the same points that we made these other marks, just so they meet up at the joint line. And it's quite simple. And at the cutoff line. And then we just simply take a uh, compass and measure from the chalk line exactly where uh, the point held at one point and 
the pencil on the other and just simply mark where exactly. Now, as the line crosses over the chalk, you'll see, you can quit easy, very easily see exactly where that joint is supposed to end. So that's a really simple trick. Just discovered that by accident one day. And you can just make a pencil mark on there and all along there and you'll you'll exactly describe the point at which the mold hits uh, at this point, this across here, where exactly that distance is, is then marked very precisely dealt within uh, probably less than a millimeter, exactly where you want. Then you can simply remove that material using a, uh, holding it holding it up and hand planing like this. Just remove that material like that until you're exactly down to the lines that you've that you, that you made with the compass. And in this way, you've accurately transferred the precise dimensions from the mold onto the rib. And then um, the mold, the, I should say, the, the rib will then be very compliant and it will easily conform because there's much less wood. This is one of the reasons probably why I think um, historical lute makers like to make multi-rib lutes because the wood actually can move in this dimension, not just in this dimension, but across the grain as well. And you can actually bend the wood a little bit and it, you can make the joints a slightly curved because that's kind of what the flattened back lute demands. It, the, 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 um, the joints aren't entirely planar, they're, they're slightly curved, so uh, it, it just makes a lot of sense to have that dimensional flexibility. Okay, I've, I've uh, made these uh, pencil marks all across the uh, rib width or at these marked points, so I'm, I'm, I'm confident that they're an accurate description of what's on the mold. And now I've taken a, a correction pen, white correction fluid, because it's very difficult to see the pencil marks. And um, I just make a little dot right where the pencil mark is. And that just seems to make a lot of sense to me to be able to see exactly where I'm supposed to be cutting. And these, um, this correction fluid easily comes off with solvent if you, if you, if any of it's left on the on the finished rib. And um, it, on the other hand, it makes a nice, accurate point to cut to, and I'm really confident that they are completely uh, properly placed. And you can see they're, they're quite apparent to the eye. Uh, right at the end of each chalk line, there's a little dot of indelible white. So, whereas the chalk isn't really very precise, the, the, the correction pin is extremely precise. Well, I've now gone ahead and uh, using the jointer plane and other smaller planes, but mainly the jointer plane. Um, th and the reason being that I want to keep that, uh, that line as planar as possible. Removing material with a shorter plane, you're going you're gonna to get into problems with, uh, with it not being in a straight line. So it's always preferable to use the jointer plane, even though it takes a little longer. So now I've gotten, uh, I think you can see, I've, I've mostly bisected these little white dots that I put on there. And uh, going back to the mold, um, the, uh, the, the loop ribs are now uh, meeting, and the, the loot is, I would say, the, the, this rib is now about 90% uh, fitted. And the only thing left to consider is the fact that, of course, I have, I have spacers. Um, and the spacers take up about a millimeter wide or millimeter and a half. So I've, I'm now within a millimeter, this line is now within a millimeter of being the final rib profile. And I want to be very sure that it's uh, just about accurate so that the, uh, all of the loop ribs at any point on the mold are about equal in width. And I'm not too particular about that. As long as it's close, I'm fine because I've discovered that even if you're examining the loot very carefully, um, close up, it's very difficult for you to perceive equal distances. They seem equidistant enough within a millimeter is close enough. So, uh, so then I have more or less got the loop rib fitted. Sometimes you find uh, that uh, just because of the vagaries of wood, it's it's not a perfectly predictable substance. Although rosewood is a very good one in that respect, that the wood um, sometimes flares a little bit up in one area just because of the way the grain is, um, and then it, it on the other hand it will lie down very flat in another area of the mold, 
And it's, it's impossible to make these. You're not making these molds with any kind of digital accuracy, and you're not made by CNC machinery. I'm sure we'd like that, but that's, they're usually just made by hand, and it's impossible to get them perfectly accurate. So um, sometimes it's necessary to just raise the ribs slightly underneath here. Uh, just by I, what I do is I just put it a little toothpick there and just chop it off like that. And I find that if there was one area that was too flat and the ribs weren't really meeting very well there, especially in this most curved part of the mold as it curves down to the bottom here, um, that just corrects it perfectly and they line up really, really well. And then you don't have to do too much scraping, thinning the wood and making the bowl weaker and the, the joint smaller. And that, so that's a, a great trick. And I don't know how I came up with that. It just occurred to me one day that I could cheat. And here I have a piece of uh, purfling. This is the uh, spacer material. It's called. Turn turn that off so you can hear me. Um, this is these are called spacers or fillets purfling, and the, in this case I've chosen a uh, purfling which is made of hop horn beam, which is a kind of uh, I think it's an eastern uh, Car Carolina forest wood, and uh, it's sometimes used for the soles of planes. It's it's ra rather white colored or slightly sort of ivory colored. Um, and of course, in former times, they would have used ivory for this purpose. And the, um, the, the advantage of using these fillets is that uh, they kind of mediate between the two levels of the ribs and, and permit a, a better fit, really. Um, and all I did is wet it, and then I have these uh, two um, hose clamps on here on the, on the bending iron, and there's a piece of iron in there which is kind of cut to a certain shape, and it fits over the the curve and then I just put it in there and, and the, the heat bends it on, on the axis. It most doesn't want to bend it. will bend fine this way, of course, but bending it vertically it, 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 because of the beam strength here in engineering terms, that makes it a little more, uh, a little more tricky. But um, it, it ultimately it, it proves to be the vector of the glue because I put the glue on both sides of this purfling, um, spreading the glue on, on both sides and then on the rib as well and that uh, introduces the glue into the joint without having to try to spread glue on the, the rib that's already on the mold, which would be very difficult and messy and you'd get glue on the mold and the problems could result from that as I found out in the past. So I do like to use these spacers and they were often used in loops um, to uh, introduce the glue. Okay, we're got the glue on there and I used uh, push pins along the um, outside of the mold to push the spacer which has the glue on it and also I glue the, rib, the inside surface of the rib and uh, I put it on there and use push pins to just hold it temporarily in place. I'll remove these but that holds it on there while I'm putting on the furniture tacks. And the furniture tacks I have to thank uh, Bob Lundberg for this trick because I used to use tape but tape doesn't really work very well. The ribs aren't really wide enough when you have smaller ribs it's very difficult to make them stick the, for the tape to really stick properly. It was fine with wide rib loops. I'd used it for years, but um, the furniture tacks are shaped like a tiny little wedge and uh, all you got to do is put, put it in there and use a, a real tack hammer. It has a thin blade on one end and a little hammer, hammer head on the other and you just give it a couple of taps like that and then you just drive it in and it holds the rib down and the wedge shape forces the rib against the rib next to it. So then you just carefully go along and in about every four or five centimeters, drive a tack in there. And that works like crazy.